And please give me a, a thumbs up if you can, if you see it. If it says promoting contribution. Okay, great, great, great. Welcome, and again, my apologies. Welcome to Promoting um, Contribution. This is the first of three classes that have been designed for IETF um, working group chairs. And the development of these classes was highly collaborative with an IETF advisory group that included, included current and former um, working group chairs. And I think some members of that advisory team may be attending the meeting today. If you are, can you give me a thumbs up? I, if you are part of the advisory, the development of these, these courses or these trainings. I see Dhruv, I think he was a part of the advisory. Okay. I'm sorry, give me one second. I'm trying to see the chat, if there's anyone in the chat. Okay, great. I am going to, um, going to get started. Um, my name is Dewana Williamson, and I'm excited to facilitate this training. Um, I also led the training that was conducted um, last year. And while the topics are the same, these trainings have received an intense makeover, and it's my hope that they will resonate um, with this group. Um, now, I'd love to just take a few minutes for everybody to introduce themselves. Please say your name, how long you've been a working group chair, if you are one, and where you are located. And we can, I don't, again, if you could just jump in and then call on someone else to go next, that would be helpful um, for me. And if you feel so inclined, it'd be great to have you on camera. Hi, I'll jump um, in alphabetical order in the chat, in the participant list. I'm Dominique Bartel. I'm the co-chair of the Rural Working Group, and I've been so for two or three years now. And I'm located in France, so good afternoon to you. <laughs> and uh, next would be Karsten among the participant. Well, actually, yeah. Matthew was before me in the alphabet. Since you went to the organizer, so anyway. So can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Carsten Bormann. Um, I have been uh, working group chair since about 2000 in various uh, working groups. And uh, uh, I still believe that all dogs can learn new tricks. And I'm located in Germany. Nice to meet you. Um, please forgive me if I pronounce names wrong, but um, Jean Mahoney, can you go next? Hi, I'm Jean Mahoney. Um, I am co-chair of two working groups, um, SIPCOR and ASAP, um, both having to do with the session initiation protocol. I am located in uh, the Dallas area in oh. Texas. That is where I am as well. Nice to meet you. Dhruv, can you go next? Yeah, thanks, Duana. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Dhruv. Uh, I chair the PC working group in routing area. And I've been a working group chair for the last uh, four to five years. I can't <laughs> recall correctly. And I also helped uh, Duana and the, the bunch of other co-chairs with revision uh, of this thing. So it was a pretty good experience. Hope you guys enjoy the training. And I'm based in Bangalore, India. Um, I am going to call on, let's see. Susan? Hi, can you hear me? I'm yeah. Susan Hares. I'm the current co-chair of IDR. It's a long-term working group since the 90s. I have been a co-chair of four or five working groups in the ITF 
since the 90s as well. So hopefully, or earlier, um, I guess earlier, uh, maybe into the 80s, 1980s. So I guess I've been around a long time. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you. Karan, can you go next? Hi, um, my name is Kiran Makhijani. I am a newbie chair of a very newly formed work group called Stub Network for Auto Configuration Snack. And um, I'm hoping to learn a lot from these type of sessions. It's, uh, it's a great experience to be a chair. And I am based in California Bay Area. Nice to meet you. Um, Matthew. Hi, yes, um, I'm Matthew Bocci. Let's see if my, my video works. Um, and uh, I've been a co-chair for probably 10, 15 years um, in the ITF. I started with ANCP and, and PWE3. Um, I'm currently co-chair of the BEST Working Group and the MBO3 Working Group, and I'm based uh, near Brighton in the UK. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I'm going to call a last name so I won't offend anyone. Kozlowski? Uh, yeah, so my name is Wojciech Kozlowski. Uh, I'm co-chair of the Quantum Internet Research Group in the IRTF, and I'm based in Delft uh, near Amsterdam. Welcome. Um, I see Simone. Prah um, okay, I'm going to maybe Simone can't hear me. Hear me, Prahi. Hi, this is Prachi Jane. I am based out of Dallas, Texas, as well. So hello, and I'm currently co-chair of Tigris Working Group. This is my first time chairing as well, and I am looking forward to this training. Thank you. Thank you. And now I think I see Simone. Now I think that might be the. Yeah, sorry about it. Uh, so my name is Simone and I'm co-chairing the ICCRG, uh, the Congestion Control Research Group. Started recently in that role, um, but I've been at the ITF um, participating, but most of the time as a listener since 2015. Great. Is there someone who hasn't gone yet? I hope you me, maybe. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm I'm Miriam Kuna and I'm, I'm located in Amsterdam. Um, I wonder what sake if I will see you tomorrow at the Quantum Hackathon. <laughs> um, but um, I've actually not I'm not chairing a working group at the IETF and Greg has kindly allowed me to participate. I'm chairing another technical community that's the RIPE community in, in Europe. And I participated last year as well and I, I really liked it and I heard that you've um, reviewed uh, or redone the course so I want to participate again. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you for coming back. I think, Greg, I'm sure everyone knows you, but maybe just say a couple of, oh, you already said some words. I'm going to skip over you, Greg, so we can save time. <laughs> but thank you. Unless you want to say something. Uh, I will just say hello again to everybody and thanks for joining. Uh, I hope you find this training valuable and um, yeah, look forward to uh, sharing the experience with you. Okay, let's jump in. So my plan um, is for this class to be highly interactive. The You'll see that the slides are content dense. So I'll just highlight points and anyone is welcome um, to jump in if you have questions or points you wanna elaborate on or pause for discussion. Um, and in addition to that, there um, are questions at the end of almost each section that we'll, we'll pause on and, um, and talk a little bit about. You can also um, put comments in the chat too, if that is, um, that's helpful as well. I'll be um, trying to keep an eye out on the chat also. So today we're going to talk about a little bit about the growth 
mindset, an inclusive and agile mindset. We're going to talk about promoting contribution on the mailing list, um, managing um, personality types, and then we'll have a discussion again at the end of class or at the end of this training. So we're gonna start out talking about this growth mindset. So this is a, a, a quote by Carol Dweck, who was a Stanford psychologist who conducted studies on the power of our beliefs, both conscious and unconscious, and how changing even the simplest of our beliefs can have a profound impact on nearly every aspect of our lives. So there are multiple um, ways that a leader's mindset um, benefits the group. And here I am using leader and working group chair interchangeably, just to say that up front, because you'll see in some of the slides where I say working group chair, and sometimes I say leader, they are one in the same for the, the purposes of, um, of our conversation today. But a, a working group chair with a growth mindset sees beyond the immediate issues and challenges and pushes the group to go beyond their current thinking. So they maintain a focus on new opportunities. And additionally, leaders with a growth mindset push for collaboration. They have a collaborative approach and they use the group's input to come up with optimal solutions. And a growth mindset is not something that you're born with, which is the beauty of it, right? It can be developed, or it, is, it actually is developed over time and can be developed by anyone who desires um, to develop it. And one way of developing a growth mindset is by, by reorienting yourself around change and by seeing change as a way to drive improvement in ourselves, the working group, systems, structures, whatever um, it may be that we need to um, execute on some type of change. And becoming self-aware is about having clarity on how you enter a conversation and ensuring you are in the correct headspace to make appropriate decisions. So it's important when you are working um, with participants, it's important for you to have um, the proper mindset in order to engage and actually model um, engagement and um, you know, helping other people to contribute, whether it be on the mailing list or whether it be in a in-person um, setting. So having self-awareness is, is critical to bringing, to promoting engagement in others. And also self-awareness is about your emotional state in the moment. <laughs> there are ways to create and nurture a growth mindset. So one way is to recognize and reward failure. And failure is a part of any process. So when we think about iteration and making things better, there is always some inherent element of failure. So we just need to expect that as we are working to get um, towards um, optimal solutions. And in nurturing a growth mindset, it's important to recognize failure as a tool that leads um, to better solutions. I know often we're motivated to reach a final result, like we want to get to the end, we want to, to finish it. But what's more important um, for this type of work actually is, is embracing the process as an ongoing project. And by understanding this, it allows us to be open to having to change course, when necessary. But since we have a clear process, we know that ultimately our repeatable process will get us to the, um, to the best or desired result. And the last way I'll talk about to create and nurture a growth mindset is by practicing perseverance. So getting to the optimal technical solution will in most cases take a lot of patience. I'm sure that you all have all experienced that. And patience and perseverance are critical in doing, doing this work and having these skills helps to set a good example for the working group. 
when you show resilience um, and the willingness to push through the difficulties of getting to a solution, the working group will notice and see that as an example. And this goes to the point that I'll probably continuously make about modeling behaviors and modeling actions. And maybe people won't get there immediately, but, but hopefully eventually um, they will. All right, I am going to pause and stop talking for a minute. And I'd like to just have a few minutes conversation about um, your thoughts on whether ha does having a growth versus a fixed mindset matter when leading IETF working groups? And if so, why? This is a question for the group, so please feel free to jump in. Okay, I'm I'm going to this is Jean Mahoney and um I'll jump in and um I appreciate growth mindset generally. Um my working my two working groups have very limited remits. So um growth um in, in scope creep is not encouraged. Um one of my working groups should be shutting down soon um when the the documents move on. Um, and then my other working group is a maintenance group. So um, we work on very small self-contained issues and we bounce anything that seems bigger than that to um, the dispatch working group in the uh, art area. So people can take a look at those those issues and see if it needs a, a new working group. So so yes, generally growth mindset good uh, with my two very limited working groups. Mm. <laughs> we just need to focus. Okay. Okay. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Uh, uh, Jean, I think uh, uh, just for one point that comes to our mind is in working groups, we are anyway bound by the working group charter. So as such, we don't really apply the growth mindset with respect to like the charter creep or feature creep per se. When we were, when I was thinking about this, it was basically, are we getting enough inputs? Yeah. Is there more growth in terms of how we can do our process better? Are enough people speaking up? Are we listening to more people? Are we getting more cross area feedback? So growing our process a little bit better uh, as we currently run the working group. And I think I cut Kiran off. So Kiran, please go ahead. Uh, you cut me just at the right time. I was going to make the same point that uh, growth is kind of limited for us. We are bound by the charter and that is our guiding principle. Whenever things are going off track, we actually try to home in by saying, okay, this is not part of our charter. So it looks like we are more fixed and limited mindset rather than the growth oriented thing in terms of the work to be done. Yeah, let me, I, I do want to bring some clarity to, to this. The, the growth and fixed are not about the 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 working group projects those specific things it is about the mindset that you bring to it it's about the mindset that you have in doing in doing the work and growth doesn't mean that you're growing the project it just means that you are open to contributions from others in the team that you have a mindset that helps to engage contribution. I mean, fundamentally, this is about getting the, the content that you need from individuals to have the optimal solution. And that's what we mean by, by growth, not growing the scope or the amount of work, but just having some depth as to how you do the work. Karsten, I see your hands up. Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty important to, to be uh, prepared for surprises. Uh, so when we uh, cooperate in, in creating a charter for a working group, uh, then we have certain expectations. And then we, when we actually set up the working group and, and start the work, uh, we will be surprised in, in some ways. There will be people coming in uh, with uh, approaches and ideas and so on that, that we haven't thought about. 
And uh, one result of that can actually be that uh, uh, changing the, the charter is a good thing to do. So um, yes, we are constrained by the charter, but really the, the most important thing about the charter is that the chairs can use it to rein in uh, red holes and, and discussions that, that uh, go out of uh, the scope of the group. Of course, the ISG also watches um, the charter. But I really wanted to, to dwell on those uh, surprises. So when, when you start out doing some work and maybe you are in the process already for six months and, and you have found an editor that, that uh, really moves the document forward and, and then suddenly somebody comes up with an, an idea that, that really is odd and, and uh, uh, well, your, your first uh, reaction is, uh, 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 we, we will have to redo all this work if we actually uh, uh, accept this this change. And and of course, that, that, that's a valid consideration if you are in, under time pressure and have a customer SDO that, that wants the result uh, at a particular point in time, then you you may not have an option uh, to do so. But I think we all have to, to control our expectations in the sense that uh, we will be surprised and we need to be able to embrace those surprises and, and use them to actually get a better output uh, from the working group. Thank you. I'm going to call on um, Wojciech. Yes, and then Prachi, and then we're going to go move on, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, so because this is a session on soliciting contribution, um, I think, and also because while well, many people mentioned charter as a, since I chair culture research group, our charter is a bit more loose and open-ended. In terms of growth, I think it would be, I at least would like to focus on growing the group of people that contribute in terms of, because since our topic is very odd, uh, it's quantum internet, it, it means that we get a lot of attendees but very few contributors who, because of what I find is a lot of them are a bit shy to speak up in front of others and because they very happily approach uh, each other and myself after the session. But during the session, there's a bit of shyness. So at least in this sense, some kind of growth mindset of growing contribution in some way uh, is something I'd like to uh, explore in this session. Awesome. Thank you for that. Hi, this is Prachi again. So I just wanted to quickly uh, second what Karsten said, like um, how, I mean, we we are exactly, our my working group is exactly in the same situation where we got, we are a fairly new working group. It's been about, I think, only six months. And then um, we got a ton of feedback in last two ITFs and we are in a phase where we are planning to recharter and add those all feedbacks. Um, so yeah, embracing all the changes that are coming in and adopting that growth mindset there. Thank you. Okay, I am going to move us along. Thank you for that. That was a um, great and rich discussion and we'll have an opportunity to have some more of that. Let's talk about the inclusive mindset and I'm probably gonna try to go a little um, little faster here. So please, you know, slow me down if, um, if you want to jump in or add something. But there are some, there are some signature traits um, to an inclusive mindset. Can anyone really quickly tell me what they what you think I mean by an inclusive mindset or what it means to be an inclusive leader? An inclusive leader, inclusive leaders have an ability to make group participants or team members feel included. They have an ability to kind of draw those quiet people in and to help them feel safe to contribute um, in, the, in the group. So it matters because the more people feel included, the more they speak up, go the extra mile and collaborate, all of which ultimately lifts the working group performance. Um, research conducted by Juliet Fork, 
a PhD a professor of practice in the School of Management and Governments, Governance, and um, Andrea Titus, a consultant in human capital at Deloitte and a PhD candidate, found that most inclusive leaders share a cluster of six signature traits. I'm going to touch on these quickly. But Inclusive leaders have a visible commitment to diversity. They challenge the status quo they, and consider diversity include, and inclusion a personal priority. They see it as a critical piece of getting to optimal solutions. Leaders with an inclusive mindset are humble and make space for other ideas and contributions. They also have an awareness of their own bias. A couple of other signature, um, other signature traits of an inclusive mindset is leaders who have an inclusive mindset have curiosity about others. Um, they practice listening without judgment. Um, they are active listeners and they listen for understanding and not to respond. These leaders work towards cultural intelligence. They work towards understanding of co the cultural differences that may impact how the working group works together. And they work to leverage these differences. The ability to create a platform for effective collaboration is fundamental to having an inclusive mindset. And it just empowers others and creates space um, for a contribution from various working group members. Just one second. I'm sorry someone is ringing my bell. My doorbell. So my apologies in advance. So there are also some benefits of an inclusive mindset for teams. Um, and ultimately, a working group that has a leader and participants who have an inclusive mindset empower the group and allow for input from various voices. Um, this type of leadership creates a psychologically safe environment and people feel free to contribute. Does anyone have any questions or closing thoughts on the benefits of an inclusive mindset? Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the agile mindset, the agile mindset. So the agile mindset is a thought process that involves understanding, collaborating, learning, and staying flexible to achieve high performing results. And by combining that agile mindset with processes and tools, teams can adapt to change and deliver incremental value to the working group. And just with the just with just as with the growth and inclusive mindset, there are some some signature um, traits of those who have an agile mindset. Um, individuals with an agile mindset are self organized. They empower others to get things done, as opposed to dictating the specific actions. So they create an environment. Um, for people to kind of get to optimal solutions in what in the way that is suitable to them. So agile leaders are good at providing direction without micromanaging um, the situation. Um, and and self-organization implies that an agile team does not have to be told what to do by the working group chair. They can they're led by the working group chair or the working group chair facilitates, but they aren't specifically told, you know, how because the working group chair in in I assume most cases may not be the content um, expert there. But also agile leaders lead with transparency in an effort to provide the working group with the vision and goals, especially when changes are imminent and the group or team must change course. So these leaders are, they're open to shifting and beginning again and ready to adapt to any type of, of change all in an effort to get, again, get to optimal solutions. 
and they don't see change, you know, as a, ba a barrier, they see it as something to embrace. And then Agile Leader also encourages feedback and constructive criticism, criticism. So they are focused on getting to the best solution. Agile leaders also accept new ideas and they are not attached to one way of thinking, which feels like that is something that you all just touched on in the, in the exchange. But they see iteration as a critical component of getting to the optimal solution. They anticipate and invite change in the process and they're humble and acknowledge their own opportunities to learn more, which is really important from a modeling perspective too for the, for the working group. And then there are multiple benefits to the working group or team when the when working group chairs and participants have agile mindsets. So I think I mentioned earlier that this kind of thinking creates an environment where people feel um, good contributing and giving voice to their thinking, right, as, as one benefit of it. And the working group tends to be more solutions driven because they have a common goal of getting to the optimal solution. It doesn't mean that they agree, but it does mean that their priority is getting to the right answer and not necessarily who is providing, they're not who is providing it. So they're not focused on the who, they're focused on the what. And also agile leaders create an environment where where everybody feels accountable, which is important to the, the working group success. Everybody feels accountable for getting to the to optimal technical solutions. And having a leader with an agile mindset can create a team that is open to sharing their own knowledge, um, which can also be helpful because you're hearing from new, from new voices, people who may have different thinking on different things. And this also creates space for innovation. Um, and this type of leadership builds teams that share in the success. So success is not seen as being held by one individual, it's seen as being held by the entire working group. <clears throat> okay, I again, I'm going to stop talking. So just want to pose these two questions for discussion. How can having an agile mindset improve working group effectiveness and productivity and have how can having an agile mindset improve working group meetings? Or do you think it's not important? <laughs> um. This is Dominic speaking. Uh, I'm not answering your question, I, I know, but it seems to me that what I heard is if you, if you have an agile mindset, then everything would be great. And I was kind of expecting this training to be, well, what are the few tricks you could use or what are the a list of things to check such that you make sure you have an agile mindset in a given situation. Um, so is that coming next or? Well, th this part was really about saying like what it, what it means with the implication that these are things that you can can practice and learn to do. It's not to say that things will be great. They will not be great. I think what happens is like as you as you develop your own mindset though, it helps to um, create a more productive working group. So we'll get to specifics about promoting um, contribution through mailing list and some of the things that you will need to do will probably requ will require that you have that you have a growth mindset, that you have an inclusive mindset and an agile mindset. It's really speaking to your, um, ability to navigate like the challenges that will that will um, arise. This is really probably just foundational to um, to leadership or leading a group or team or working group in in multiple um, facets or aspects. Is that helpful? Because it's not meant to say that things will be wonderful. These are just things that can help 
um, you work through situations and get to optimal solutions. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I just wanted to point out that um, th this has two components. W one is um, the, the chair or the chairs themselves having an agile mindset, and that's also true of inclusive, an inclusive mindset. Uh, but of course, the, the other question is, how can you actually induce your, your other working group members to also operate from that mindset? And I think that that's actually the harder a problem because it's it's kind of almost a given that a group like the ITF needs to be run with an agile uh, mindset and and probably by by now it's well understood that inclusion is important or inclusivity is important but how do you get other people to to actually think that way as well Does anybody want to, I, I have some thoughts, but does anyone else want to kind of respond to that? Yeah, I, I put on, agree with Kasten that that's a much harder problem. Uh, and we have, especially in our working group settings, sometimes have limited tools uh, because sometimes we also want to give people enough space to argue and discuss, but we should always sort of like have boundaries in our mind that like, you know, when things are no longer agile and things are being not inclusive, I think as a leader, we have to sort of stop that and set an example. And, uh, and like, you know, you, in fact, talk to other working group participants in one-to-one -one ways uh, as well. Uh, that is like, you know, urge them towards that this is where the behavior is going wrong. Sometimes we don't do that as working group chairs because we feel that our more important role is to let the discussion happen and not interrupt the discussion. But I think we may have to change that mindset. That's what uh, I've been thinking about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think I, I, one thing that we really wanted to um, represent here was the idea of modeling, right? These behaviors, because ultimately you can't always change other people's behaviors, but you can like set expectations for what you will um, tolerate. And I think that is what a lot of this is about. And we're going to get to some specifics. And since we're our, our time is kind of tight, I'm going to move to this um, promoting contribution on mailing lists, which really comes from um, um, IETF specific um, documents and has pulled um, the, the thinking that is is, is found there. So these may feel more relevant and specific, but again, the earlier conversation is about modeling these behaviors and then for yourself, modeling for them for the working group and reflecting them as an expectation. So the, there are ways that the IETF has identified to lead mailing list contributions. And there are some specifics um, that, that they say, one is to guide the process and don't do everything yourself. And this is about getting you know, contribution, promoting contribution for others. So ask others to assist and participate and exercise that, that muscle of, of delegation. So revisiting decisions is also a way to get additional input and or to pressure test what was decided. So this can generate new ideas, which can be beneficial in getting to the optimal um, solution. And balance agreement and progress and then memorialize decisions. So summarize key arguments in the working group mailing list and share any of those decisions on the mailing list in the minutes of the next live session and summarize the decision history in the final working group documentation. Is there anything, would someone add anything here? Uh, in fact, I would ask Sue to maybe uh, talk about it. I've seen that IDEA working group do this very well. Maybe she can share. Okay. Um... One of the problems we had in the last year is that um, 
we had a decision which was contentious uh, based on two competing environments and the uh, collaboration was not high. So in order to guide the process, we ended up breaking uh, a discussion for a review of a contribution uh, into pieces. And then uh, by doing that, we tried to focus the contribution, but not constrain the users. However, we do we did run into, as I'm sure uh, Carson and several uh, Gene and other people have seen, sometimes you run into behaviors which are not uh, appropriate for mail list. In other words, it's not appropriate to say your opinion is junk. It's appropriate to say these are the technical reasons why I don't agree. So we had to do that in order to handle it because the mail list was extremely voluminous. Uh, I ended up uh, recording the decisions and then um, mail lists aren't always easy for people to rapidly read. I ended up creating a summary uh, that was short within a page or two. And then in some cases, one of the discussions went to about an 80 page document. We ended up posting the summary uh, and the full details on our wiki. I ended up sending the summary. Uh, one thing I did in order to make it not have problems with the key contributors is they got to review my write-up before I sent it out. It, it involves a great deal of decisions, but uh, one thing in conflict uh, you learn is that you have to communicate more. Mm -hmm. um, this is an abnormal case. Normally, I the IDR chairs sit back and, and uh, let the conversation roll, only stepping in uh, when people are out of bounds and we tend to do that privately. I hope that's what Dhruv was referring to. Uh, I hope that's useful uh, in the circumstance. I can refer Dewana to the um, leadership text that I used for that as well, as you know my background. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> I too hope that was helpful. That um, so that that specific example definitely spoke to encouraging um, collaboration and making it easy for people to understand what's happening to have transparency and an awareness, which sounds like it helped in getting um, to a to a to a good um, solution and and working place. Um, but there, there, there are ways to encourage mailing list collaboration as we all just talked about. But one thing you can do is ensure there's alignment on the objectives. So test for this alignment by asking clarifying and probing questions um, of the working group and ensure that the working group knows what they can expect from you. So um, and create a collegial environment. So one in which people feel empowered to contribute their ideas, model active listening and respond to everyone's ideas. And I think those are, it sounded like those are things that Sue actually lifted in her example. Um, so the, also like as the, the chair, right, you have the authority um, to reject or defer participant input based on a couple of things. So one reason might be for redundancy. So the, the, it could be if the topic has already been addressed and resolved and the participant input is not new, it's redundant and can be um, rejected or deferred. Another reason would be that it's not relevant or it has no impact on the topic or solution um, being discussed. So it might be important info, but not necessarily currently relevant. 
Um, and then the input might be relevant, but the timing's not right. So the topic has, has not yet been open for discussion. It could be something that you have to come back around to, but it's good to let um, people know that that is the case, that you will be coming back around to, um, put, um, to this specific input. And it also could be that the input is out of scope or not part of the, the working group charter, which is another reason um, to, to reject. Would anyone add um, anything to this? Okay. I, I would add one thing if you would go back to that slide. One of the things that's important that you didn't include is something that was inherent in my discussion, which is it is important to reject um, a discussion which uh, uses logic to take the working group off the focus. You know, the focus is you're looking at this document, you're reviewing it, here are the pros and cons. You know, when someone says, oh, but I reject the decision we made to go this direction five months ago and I still hate it, that's a really, t you know, yes, you can tell me that as a chair, no, it's not appropriate in a particular discussion. Um, because we've made that decision and we have to make decisions and go on. You can tell me as a chair that that decision is broken, but that's not appropriate to keep bringing up over the time period. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Um, it's a re continual reevaluation like Jean indicated. We have a schedule, we have a timeline, we have to make decisions and go on. Mm -hmm. Yes, that makes total sense. So sometimes email lists have to be moderated for a multitude of reasons. And when this happens, it's important to follow the ISGE guidelines. And I won't read them. They're all um, listed, um, listed here. I am going to go on, since we have six minutes um, left, I'm going to go to this um, last slide of questions. And um, Sue gave us an example of, um, gave us a strategy for managing mailing lists. Are there other strategies that people have used that you think would be helpful to this group? And of those strategies, which ones worked and what, what strategies have not worked well for you? One thing which I wanted to highlight was sometimes it's important that some discussion should not happen on the mailing list. And mailing lists could in fact be constraining uh, in a constructive uh, discussion because of the very nature of people uh, not being open. Sometimes we need to put them, take the discussions off list and let people uh, come back to the mailing list with a better uh, discussion so that it can go on. Uh, and I think that also is sort of very important in our process. We want everything to be transparent, but sometimes that doesn't help to move the process along as well. We need to get the key folks uh, in design teams and like, you know, in on calls sometimes, and then bring the discussion back to the mailing list to make progress. Mm -hmm. Are there other strategies that people or any comments or feedback on that? Yeah, I think I agree with that, that previous point. There's many cases when the appropriate action is actually to take it off the mailing list and maybe put it in the design team as an example. Um, mailing lists, in my experience, can often work against the inclu inclusivity because they can be intimidating to people mm -hmm. because as they're exposing their opinions. They're not confident enough or self-confident enough to expose their opinions to very large numbers of people on a list, whereas they may work 
more effectively in a smaller design team um, and feel happier working in a small design team. So I, I think certainly for resolving conflicts, often design teams are, 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 are a better way to go than um, having the debate on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. One strategy that, that sometimes has worked for me and sometimes hasn't uh, was to define a topic of the week. Um, so uh, the mailing list got the instruction to, to focus on a specific uh, topic for a while. So we, we could make some progress on that, which of course didn't, didn't uh, disallow, but, but discourage uh, bringing up other uh, subjects. So that, that can help, but it's not always working. The, the, thing I really would need help on is how do I get uh, the members of the working group to actually read the mail. Yeah. Um, so they often comment on, on threads um, without having read the, the thread to the entire thread. They, they do, do have some knee jerk reactions um, and so on. And um, this leads to, to very dysfunctional discussions that are hard to, to uh, uh, draw conclusions from. Of course, the working group chair can, can summarize occasionally to make it easier for people um, to actually follow what's going on. But uh, I think our toolkit for handling this is not yet very good. I, I think I, I want to jump in here. We have two minutes left there because we did get a late start. There is a, the last section that I'm not going to have time to talk about, but it is actually managing personality types, which I think might get a little bit to what um, I think Karsten was bringing up. Um, earlier about like the the group dynamic and how you manage that. And that was when we would talk a little bit about that. These slides will be available to you and also they'll be um, on demand training, which will have all of this where, where I'll also address like managing these, these difficult personality types and what that looks like um, in practice. So that might be helpful. I just wanted to, um, to add that. Um, before um, before we end it, and also there's a link to the survey to rate this class um, in the in the chat. So please make sure that you um, that you do that. And with a minute left, I just want to say thank you, um, everybody. And again, my apologies for the the mishap with with timing and schedules. We will get this right the, um, the, the next time, but please take a look at the on-demand training for the last piece of this as well. Is there anything else anyone would like to say? Okay, th again, thank you. And I hope to see you in the next training, which is Resolving Conflict, which will be next week, um, December 7th at the same time. <laughs>